welcome to the Helsus Global South uh, Encounters with me, Franklin Obinodum, Associate Professor of Sustainability Science with Global Development Studies as the chair. Today, I connect uh, from Dakar, Senegal, uh, the home of the Museum of Black Civilizations, uh, a major center for the vigorous demand uh, of African reparations and repatriation of everything stolen from Africa. If you would like to stay connected between the encounters, I would like to draw your attention to our new Twitter account and just ecological political economy, uh, the Helsus Global South blog, links to which you can see in the chat. I am an invisible man. Uh, no, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. No, am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in a circus side shows, uh, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is today the Black people of Colombia. They are overlooked and the violence they suffer as a result of being made invisible is similar to how flight attendants and waitresses overlook Black people. To use an analogy of the Black feminist, Dr. Lebohan Feko. Mainstream analysts invisibilize Afro-Latins uh, by claiming that they do not exist their land does not exist, or if they and their land exist, then they are the cause of their own problem, their own economic and environmental catastrophe. Western progressives, on the other hand, perpetuate the myth of a post-racial Latin America. For them, only class and capital are important, largely concerned about present ecological problems. These progressives overlook the historical institution of slavery and its long and persistent shadow on ecological problems. Yes, these Western analysts probe the conditions of indigenous people in Latin America, but largely within an eco-humanist framework, not within an ecological, political, economic framework. And they certainly do not engage the chattel slavery of Afro-Latins whose present and past are interlocked in ways that shape the future. In short, Black people in Latin America, in Colombia, are not only invisible, they are also Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Fortunately, a few political economists from the global south have much deeper insights. Quote, it is simplistic to blame the collective ownership of Afro-Colombian lands for the poverty in Colombia's Pacific Coast region. We have evaluated the effect of collective property on development 
in the area, comparing Afro-Colombian communities who have collective land titles with those who have none. Collective titling significantly reduces poverty, increases mean household income, improves children's school attendance in primary education, and promotes housing investment. Holding a stake in collective property indicates to inhabitants that this is no longer a no man's land and motivates investment. There are still sizable gaps in the socioeconomic indicators between Colombia's Pacific and the rest of the country. But without collective titling, the situation would be even worse. The law from 1993 establishing collective land titling and the right to prior consultation constitute the only noteworthy government policy favoring Afro-Colombian communities since the country's abolition of slavery in 1851, unquote. These are the words of Professor Maria Alejandre Velez, our speaker for today's encounters. Those brave words were written not in the green left and not in Jacobin, the symbols and spaces of left-wing progressive scholarship, but in The Economist, one of the world's most liberal elite newspaper. Professor Veliz audaciously marched right into the heart of liberalism and Western thought with truth only as her shield. She literally spoke truth to power in her letter to The Economist dated 28 September 2019 and appropriately titled, The Land is the Land, and she prevailed. Underpinning her victory is a critical, important methodological breakthrough, connecting the present ecological problem to slavery, land, and race, key element in ecological imperialism. A concept missing in mainstream sustainability science, missing in mainstream economics, and poorly treated in the Western left consensus, preoccupied with symptomatic present environmental problems. But Velez has been a kind of infant prodigy, outstanding right from her undergraduate days at the Universidad de los Andes, Bogota, where she wrote the best undergraduate thesis in social sciences and economics. Now associate professor at the Faculty of Economics at the same university, she is also a founding member of the Center for the Sustainable Development Goals for Latin America and the Caribbean, where she is arguably the leading light on Southern alternatives. A PhD in Economics of Natural Resources from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, Dr. Velez previously worked at the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions at Columbia University and the Center for uh, Latin American and Caribbean studies at Duke University, both in the US. Her research focuses on governance and institutional design for natural resource management in the global south. The latest recent studies have looked at resistance strategies by Afro-Colombians to illegal cocoa crops on the land of Afro-Colombians. A highly engaged scholar, not only her works nor public engagements have commanded attention. Her presentations in scientific meetings have also been outstanding. For instance, she won the Society for Institutional and Organizational Economics Best Poster Presentation in 2015. And she has been keynote speaker around the world. As a leader in her field, Belize holds many scientific positions of trust including associate editor of the Journal of Environment and Development Economics. Professor Valise's research has shown that collective titling is a bulwark against terra nullius. But how different is it from private property rights, the sort 
championed by mainstream economists, the Economist newspaper, and the World Bank. Why does the Colombian government consistently pursue policies that contradict the aspirations of Afro-Colombians? Perhaps, Professor Veliz, let's get right into your groundbreaking and agenda-setting work by beginning with your analysis, followed by questions and comments by all of us, and then you can respond. Um, for the audience, our practice is usually to um, mute our microphones uh, or muting only when I invite you uh, to do so. But questions can be sent to me in the personalized uh, chat box. Welcome, Professor Feliz. Frank, and thank you very much for such a, a powerful introduction and very kind. And I'm really humbled to hear all what you have said. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And um, to start my presentation. Um, so um, as frankly said, and you heard uh, with the flyers, the idea of my talk is to talk about uh, whether collective titling is enough to protect forest with the evidence from Afro-descendant communities in the Colombian Pacific region with whom I've been working for the last, uh, I think, 20 years in, in different projects. But before I get to this paper, I would like to give you a little bit of context uh, uh, about Colombia, but also about the Afro-Colombian communities. So let me start with this image that for me is very powerful because it's uh, this is the map of Colombia. And uh, when you see this map, you understand that Colombia is not about only private property. So um, at least 30% of the land is collectively owned land. Uh, in yellow is a, a land um, granted to indigenous communities. And in uh, pink, purple is the land of Afro Colombian communities. Uh, the other lands that you see, it's a national, the green line uh, land is national parks and uh, peasant communities. So if you count all these, like 50% of the land of Colombia is uh, either state or collective land for conservation. Uh, so when you see this map, you have to start thinking about different um, development paths. But I'm gonna talk to you about only the land titling process of Afro-Colombian communities, which is basically around 6 million of hectares, uh, which is 5% of the, of the country. Uh, you can see that's the whole um, yellow part in the, in the map on the right. So the Pacific uh, region in Colombia is an area that goes from Panama to Ecuador and from the Western uh, uh, Andes, mountains to the Pacific Ocean, and 90% of the population in the Pacific region of Colombia are Afro-descendants. 60% lives in like urban centers, very, um, you know, small uh, urban centers, and the rest lives in 40% of the uh, banks of the rivers in the Pacific region. Uh, that area is considered a biodiversity hotspot, uh, but also is a region with a lot of um, needs in terms of uh, social uh, development. Most of the activities uh, that people in this region perform is like fishing, hunting, mining, or lodging. It's a natural resource type of uh, activities. There is a, a bit of subsistence agriculture. But what I wanted to point out here is that doesn't matter which um, indicator or socioeconomic index you look at, there is a gap between Afro-Colombian communities and the rest of the um, country. For example, life expectancy of the Colombians are 73 years, whereas for Afro-Colombians is 64 years. So it's a very vulnerable population uh, with insufficient infrastructure and public services. And you know, the uh, unsatisfied uh, basic needs index it was 26% higher to this population compared to the rest of the country. So any, any indicator that you look at um, is like that. So we are in a region in which uh, we have um, an incredible um, 
a culture and society, but there is a lot of gaps compared to the, to the rest of the country. And it's a region with a lot of biodiversity. So uh, Afro-Colombian communities have been settled in the Pacific region since the 17th century. They were part of the African diaspora. And until 1991, the Colombian government basically viewed the Pacific region as a massive forest reserve of unoccupied lands. It just didn't recognize that Afro-Colombian communities were there. Finally, in 1991, Colombian constitution for the first time recognized that we are a pluri-ethnic country and recognize the right of black rural communities to collective land titles in territories of the Pacific region. This uh, change in the constitution uh, gave you know, the, the, the way to the law 70, law 17, 1993, that basically specified the process for allocating a collective line. For some of the leaders in the Pacific, for some, maybe all of the leaders in the Pacific region, this law was the most interesting or thing that happened before the abolition of the slavery in 1851. It basically, it's the most important public policy since then. So uh, this collective land titling benefited the group of who historically occupied these territories and also with the idea of preserving valuable ecosystems. And interestingly enough, uh, it was a grant, uh, uh, a loan by the World Bank and the Interdevelopment, the uh, Interdevelopment Latin American Bank, who basically uh, fund the first way of titling. Um, so the first thing in order to have a collective titling was to create a community council, which was a political, which is a political and territorial organization that basically is the authority in the territory. Afro-Colombian communities were not organized like this. They organized, you know, they were uh, basically organized like this to access uh, the land. So it, the constitution was in 1991, finally the law was in 1993, and the first title was issued in 1996. Um, and today, as I said before, almost 6 million of hectares, which is 5% of the country, and more than 170 community councils have been created. I have to say that this collective like tightly uh, that, that happened in the Pacific now is happening in other Afro-Colombian communities in the rest of the country, but that story is uh, very different from this one. So this is a trend in, in, in developing countries, the centralization programs in natural resources management is not an, a new thing. And actually 20% of forests in developing countries are owned by communities. But Colombia was the first one to do it uh, to Afro-Colombian communities where who are not considered indigenous for Latin America. All of these reforms in Colombia and beyond had a lot of uh, characteristics that are similar. First, the right of alienation was not assigned. That is, these communities cannot divide their land and, and participate in the market. Uh, rather than redistribution, it was not like an agrarian reform, was really the recognition of rights of people who already live in the territory. The government maintains an active role in resource management. For example, if Afro-Colombian communities want to participate in forest um, uh, uh, selling wood for uh, commercial activities, need to have an environmental permit issue by the regional authorities. Uh, the allocated rights implied forest conservation in, and uh, the reforms response to development objectives and demand for ancestral rights. So. The collective property is different from a state ownership, it's not a national park, but it's different also to a private ownership. It belongs to the community, to all of the people of one community. But it's different from a traditional agrarian reform in the sense that it was not, there was not expropriation, it was not redistribution, it was the recognition that people was uh, there. As I said before, property rights belongs to the community and not to the individuals. So, you know, my framework to approach these uh, uh, studies has been the uh, commons literature. And basically with this collective titling, we move from an open access regime to a common collective ownership regime. 
and communities were given the rights of access, extraction, management, and exclusion, but they didn't have the right of alienation, which means that, as I said before, they cannot sell this in the market, which it's something that will prevent communities to access to uh, traditional credits, for example. And the idea was to perpetrate a social group that belongs to this territory in, in ancestral terms of the communities, these communities make sense in this particular territory, not in other territory. And that's why the alienation right was not uh, given. So as Franklin mentioned, uh, this collective titling process has been contested uh, in the perhaps classical economics. In the economics literature, the lack of property right has been considered an obstacle to economic development and the efficient use of resources. And traditional or classical economics literature uh, has understood collective property equal to open access, as it was a, a no man's land, basically. And that's the first misunderstanding because a collective property is implies well-defined property rights. It's just that it is defined to the community, not to an individual. So as Franklin mentioned, that letter that uh, he kindly uh, uh, read uh, at the introduction was my response to this article that uh, happened in the, the Economist, where they said, why Colombian Pacific Coast is so poor, uh, with the subtitle, No Man's Land, and they say collective land ownership holds the region back. I was really uh, furious with this uh, article because my whole uh, academic career has been studying this um, case and I understood that collective property was not no man's land, was, a ma was the land of a community. And there was a lot of evaluations that show that actually collective property uh, it has benefited the communities and the region. So I'm going to show you sort of the research that uh, was behind that letter that I wrote to the economist and that Franklin uh, just read. So what has been achieved with this change in, in, in property rights and with this uh, important law that uh, was implemented in the Pacific region? Well, first, which is something that is very difficult to measure, but I think it's already a, a well known, it basically may make visible and empower Afro-Colombian communities and their leaders. Imagine that before uh, the collective, like, uh, collective titling, for example, government will just only give uh, 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 wood concessions to private companies without asking the communities. Now, communities and uh, their leaders are, are empowered, visible, and they have the right of consultation. So community councils are recognized by Los Atenta as an ethnic group and authorities in their territory. That implies clear definition of boundaries, right to exclude outsiders and territorial control. And despite conflict in Colombia, and we can talk about that uh, later, um, Displacement of Afro-Colombian communities gain legal protection by prohibiting that others claim their land. What happened in the rest of the country is that illegal armed groups displace communities and they sell the, the land and they got private titles. In Afro-Colombian communities, even though they had been displaced, nobody has ever able to title their land because it's prohibited by law. So um, that's very important. This law basically changed the political uh, landscape of the Pacific region with the, uh, um, also because these communities gained the right of prior consultation. They have now the right of priority for mining titles. So if an uh, international company said that they want to exploit the mining in those communities, they have the, the right of do it first. And this is a conflict in the region because even though they have the land, the subsoil is still belonging to the state. But nevertheless, uh, uh, they uh, have been managing their land and they have designed a lot of management plans and formalization of rules to manage the territory. And that's other things that I have been looking at. But all these great you know, um, rights that 
they have a gain. A, a, the first question that I asked was, what about effects on quality of life? A, all this empower a change their a quality of life. And that was the first paper that we published at World Development in which we asked what was the effect of collective property on um, a life, quality of life indicators. And basically, I'm not going to get to the methodological details, but we compare Afro-Colombian communities with a, a collective titles against those without titles. And we find out that um, basically all the uh, indicators that we look at were better. Uh, there were less uh, percentage of um, families under the poverty uh, line, uh, the income increase, the assistance to uh, educational increase, uh, the um, uh, quality of the household improve, uh, and the overcrowded reduce. So basically, the fact that uh, titling, a collective titling was given to these communities, they even did investment at the household uh, level. Why? Because basically collective land title creates a more secure property rights base and a longer time horizon for household in collective territories, which leads to the investment in their private, physical, and human capital. Um, basically, what was interesting is that our results are consistent with the results of other literature that evaluates the effect of private titling for household in poverty. And we are finding the same result, but with the collective titling. Of course, uh, gaps compared to the rest of the country remains, and that's a historical depth that, that the Colombian government has with the Afro-Colombian communities in terms, for, for example, of investment of public goods, health, education, infrastructure, roads, um, and, uh, of course, reduction of violence. But uh, still, uh, um, Law 70, uh, this collective titling law was really given a push for increase of quality of life. When this paper came out, there was questionings about, okay, there was a trade-off between well-being and conservation. Maybe these communities start to improve their quality of life after this collective titling because they massively exploit uh, uh, resources. And you can think about hypotheses in either way, no? Uh, uh, when you think about if collective titling reduced deforestation rates, you can think that property rights should generate incentives to stop outsiders uh, and promote that promote deforestation. Uh, you can think that collective title will consolidate the possibility of aligning monitoring and control with community organization. Even communities can organize to sell their ecosystem services and applied for payment for ecosystem service, et cetera. But also you can think that community organization in need for resources can make agreements, even legal ones, to massive resource, extract, resource extraction. So there were hypotheses like either way. So we wanted to test basically if collective titling has been um, a, a strategy for forest conservation. And what we did was to compare changes in deforestation rates before and after the titling process with changes with similar communities without title. And now we're going to get to the methodological uh, details because we don't have time. But basically, we have data from 1990, 2000, 2005, and 2010. And uh, uh, what we did that is that since the process has taken like 20 years, we can have titling and not titling communities that are comparable in other characteristics so we can test uh, for the best. Um, for this project, and I haven't mentioned, but uh, uh, for all the projects, we basically have done also a lot of um, qualitative work. And, and for this case, we did qualitative work with more than 50 interviews with uh, leaders of these communities to understand the drivers of deforestation and the channels through which collective private property might protect forest. And briefly, what we found is that overall titling in the Pacific region has decreased deforestation by more than one percent point, which by the deforestation rates in the region, this implied 27% reduction of what would have been the deforestation rates without titling. So this is a very important result. 
Of course, the result varies across the region. But um, what we found is that uh, uh, this uh, protection happens because community uh, uh, for, for the community organizations, the governments, uh, and the design of management plans and internal codes, communities were able to uh, uh, expose legal extractive companies, forest companies, oil palm companies that were uh, basically start extracting their resources. However, I have to say this is a region with multiple challenges, expansion of illicit crops. Uh, there is challenges also in management of fisheries, illegal mining and community enterprises. Um, uh, there is still a question of how a uh, uh, productive uh, entrepreneurship will be conducted in the context of a collective titling. And uh, in particular, it's a challenge because in Colombia, we have uh, um, basically a conflict uh, and uh, um, most of the conflict is uh, fueled by the expansion of coca crops that are used to produce cocaine and uh, consume in the rest of the world. And right now, most of the, uh, or oh, a big percentage, 20% of these illicit crops are expanding in the uh, Pacific region. So even though this uh, collective titling has been very successful in increasing quality of life, in protecting deforestation, uh, it hasn't been able to protect the communities from the expansion of these illicit economies. However, um, obviously, uh, uh, this is very difficult because in many cases, this expansion of illicit economies is accompanied with uh, uh, armed groups. So what I'm studying now, it's that the community resistance, you know, uh, the risk and the strategies that the community are assuming without support from the state to resist uh, the uh, expansion of illicit economies, including coca crops, but also illegal mining. It's already 8.30, so I don't think I can go through that details, but I just want to share briefly uh, this uh, paper with you in which we show how, even though uh, the illicit economies have been expanded in the region, there is uh, not all the communities uh, uh, have had um, coca crops in their territories, and we are studying why some communities have this and why others not. And we are sort of uh, 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 having this map of type of resistance in the uh, collective Afro communities that now are resisting to this uh, illicit economies expansion. So with that, I think I'm going to stop here for questions, reactions, comments. Thank you.